If you're on the Lord's side, then guess what? It is already won for you. Amen? If you're lost and you're watching this on the internet, or if you're lost and you're here in earshot of my voice right now, then and you don't know him, then right now you're losing. But you know, it's so wonderful. I, you know, I hate watching uh, football sometimes because sometimes my team doesn't do real well. And sometimes I, you know, I love to win so much that sometimes I just want to switch right then. I just want to say, I'm gonna, oh, I'm actually going for the other team. You know, what I said at the beginning of the game, I really didn't mean it. But you know, it is such a wonderful thing that you can go through life, you can go against God, you can be playing for the other team, and eventually you're going to get to the point where you realize that you are on the losing side. But it is such a wonderful thing that you can switch, amen, and it's acceptable, amen, and it's appropriate. And God wants you to switch because guess what? He wants you to win. He wants you to win more than you want to win, amen. All right, let's, uh, we're going to open up in prayer. I do have one announcement. Uh, March the 24th, uh, p.m. service, Sunday night, we're going to have a potluck supper after the service. Uh, ask BR for details. Is that what you said? Ask BR for details. I'm getting my cue from the pastor. So, <laughs> How many is ready to worship the Lord? Amen. Are you ready to worship the Lord? Let's stand to our feet real quick and let's go ahead, before the music even starts, let's go ahead and give God praise. Just stretch your hands up in the air and begin to give Him praise right now out of your mouth. Father, we just praise You. Lord, we just give You glory. We give You honor. God, You are King. You are Lord. And we acknowledge You as Lord God. Lord, we just praise you today and we worship you. Lord, we come here, God, to learn from you. We come here, God, to, to just get in your face, God, to seek your face. We want your presence, God. Lord, we pray that if there's anything in us, God, that is not of you, that is not godly, we ask you just to come. You are a consuming fire, and we ask you to burn everything out of our lives, God, that goes against you, Jesus. Lord, let us draw close to you, Lord, and let us know you. Lord, let us leave this place different than when we came in for a, a better. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, this morning, it's been the blood theme all morning long. And praise God, we're going to try to do some songs tonight that has to do with the blood. How many knows that the blood made the difference? Amen. We would still be lost and undone without that precious blood, that divine blood. Our blood couldn't do it. The blood of bulls and goats and lambs and sheep couldn't do it and birds couldn't do it. But only one lamb, of, the lamb of God, amen, that was slain before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. That precious blood, hallelujah, that's what we're singing about tonight. That's what makes the difference tonight. That's what will cleanse you from all your sins, amen. Blood. 
just wanted you to know He's my rock, my solid foundation He's my rock, my rock that won't roll That's why I'm gonna praise Him I mean, in the house, he's your rock tonight. Hallelujah. Yeah. I know he pulled me up out of the miry clay in that horrible pit, but praise God, he set my feet on a solid rock. Hallelujah. Yeah. And he placed a new song in my heart, and that's what we're singing tonight. Praise God. He's singing about the blood of Jesus, what changed everything for me and what changed everything for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's what brought the healing. That's what brought the peace. That's what brought the joy. That's what brought the attributes of, ever, of the Spirit. Amen. The precious blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. We can't sing enough about the precious blood, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yeah. 
Praise the Lord. We do bless your name tonight, Lord. We lift up the name of Jesus. And we thank you for this great opportunity to be gathered together tonight in your name and worship you. We thank you for all of you who have done for us during this week, Father, personally. And we thank you for what you're about to do tonight in the word. But we ask you also, Father, to go with us this week and, and lead and direct us and help us, Holy Spirit, to get involved in what you want to do in our lives, this church, personally, Lord. And God, we give you praise. We do bless your name tonight. Amen. Amen. I'd like to ask the ushers if they would come now and receive God's tithes and his offerings. Let's remember uh, Becky. She's very sick. Ricky's home with her. He said that he didn't feel like he could leave her again tonight. She had been sick yesterday and then all day today. So let's remember them in prayer as we pray this week. Brother Ronnie.
How is everybody tonight? Good. Ronnie, I forgot to put that on one. Did anybody learn anything last week? A couple of you. Who wants to learn something tonight? Do y'all like learning? Do y'all like learning about calculus or algebra? What about the Lord? Well, then you qualify for tonight's message. (laughs) Amen. Praise God. Go ahead and switch this to one if you would, Ronnie. The uh, screen. Switch the screen is what I meant, sorry. Then should uh, just click on my, yeah, click right there. There we go. All right, technology can be fickled sometimes, takes a second. Let's open up to God with prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much, God. Lord, we are so blessed, God, to be alive today. Lord, as you look over this room, you see many times where the enemies tried to kill us. And Lord, as you look over this room, you see the reason why he didn't kill us. Because there was something inside of us. There was something inside of us that had the will that you knew to turn to you. You seen us, God, and you knew that we had not become reprobate in our mind. You knew, even though it seemed so distant at some times, that there was something that was in us. And there was a remnant that you found in us. And it was cause to save us. It was cause to keep your hand upon us. It was cause to keep a hedge around us and not let the enemy take us. Because there was something inside of us, God, that you put there. And Lord, you've seen our will. That there was still hope for us to turn back to you. That we had not closed up our minds to you. And God, we just thank you so much. Lord, if it were up to man, God, we would have been thrown away a long time ago. But you are a faithful God and your mercy endureth forever. We give you praise. So Lord, we're here and we're ready tonight. We're ready to learn from you, God. Lord, teach us and equip us with the revelation and the truths of your word, God, so that we can be effective for your kingdom, God, so that we can be effective in the work, God, that you have for us, so that we can be effective, God, for what you have called us to do. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for everything that comes out of us, God, while our time is here on earth. And everybody said, amen. We are on... Part eight of the priority of the kingdom mandate. And uh, we're going to be talking about a couple of things tonight and how they relate to the priority of the kingdom mandate. Did y'all enjoy the message on prayer last week? Did anybody feel like you were able to pray more effectively at some point during the week? You did. You did. Amen. I had a... I had someone send me a text and say the same thing. They were up praying. You know, I love to hear that because I love when I hear something and I know that it's God that's instructing me and getting my attention and teaching me something. You know, I, I love that. I've left services before and I couldn't tell you what was said. I can tell you a scripture that maybe was said and the only reason why I remember it is because when they said it and they read the scripture, all of a sudden my, my mind started thinking of all the stuff that I associate with that scripture. But their point, or what they said, sometimes is lost because it wasn't effective. The word didn't, come, the word didn't go back void. I got the word. But sometimes people get into this 
hooping and hollering, but there's no substance. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I want substance. I need something to change my life. Amen? Priority of the kingdom mandate, part eight. I want to start off with a question. And this is, uh, well, I won't tell you what it is first. Who in here would raise your hand and say that you want fame and power? Hmm? Anybody? I I tell you what, I figured y'all would remember this. Betty's smiling. If you say that you don't really want fame and power, I'm going to tell you that you're lying. (laughs) Maybe you don't want what your idea of fame is. I'm not talking about being Elvis or, or being in the spotlight. Let's look at fame. Fame definition is actually a common estimation or opinion generally held of a person or thing. How many of you want a good reputation? You want to, people to have a certain opinion about you that you're a good person. Amen. Uh, power is the ability to do or act. Who wants the ability to do or act? The fact that you like getting out of the bed in the morning and standing on your own two feet shows that you want the ability to do or act. The fact that you get aggravated when you get sick and you feel fatigued shows that you want the ability to do or act. Because when you're sick, your symptoms of being sick have a way of uh, crippling you from having the ability to do or to act, amen? A power is also the control over circumstances. Who wants control over your circumstances? I don't know about you, but when I tried to manage myself, I messed up a lot of stuff. And I came to the Lord because he liberated me and he gave me freedom. I wanted control over my circumstances because life was having its way with me. Amen? Really what fame and power comes down to, and this is why I'm telling you that really you do want this, is because it comes down to one word, and that word is influence. Who wants influence? If you have ever ministered to your child or you ministered to a grandchild, or if you've ever witnessed to anybody and trying to tell them about the Lord... You want influence because if you have influence, then maybe you will have some effect on them that they'll hear what you say and want what you're talking about and that they will repent. That's influence. Amen? If you have ever had an idea and someone else had an idea and you're trying to make your case of why the decision should be made your way, Instead of this way, you are wanting influence. If you have ever had a difficulty with somebody at a bank or a bill collector or anybody who's trying to tell you, no, you did not pay, and you have a check stub saying you did, and you're trying to convince them that it, that was sent it was applied it was in your system i don't care what your system says what you're wanting is influence so let me ask you again is there anybody in here who wants fame and power wants influence yeah the fame that we don't want and the power that we don't want is we don't want power and and control over people but over our circumstances amen we want the ability, the power to be able to speak to somebody who has a spirit in them and tell it to leave and you have the influence, you have the authority by Jesus Christ, you have the power by Jesus Christ who's working within you to cast it out, amen? I want that kind of influence. I'll never forget it. Um, Many of Brother Porter's stories, but one of them I remember, he said they went over to this house and there was somebody there that had a spirit And he said, whenever they came in, you know, the spirit said, uh, oh no, I didn't know you were going to bring them. 
And he, you know, and I remember Roy said, you know, at that moment, he said, you know what I could have done? Just, and he held his nose up in the air, like feeling proud. Like, and I remember him going saying, yeah, that's right. We're here. <laughs> but it made him excited. But you know why? Not but for his own glory, but it made him excited that he knew God was inside of him and that the demon was trembling because of the Jesus that was inside of him. I don't know about you, but I want that kind of influence. Amen. Amen? I want influence. I want to show you a couple of pictures. What did you say? (laughs) Superman. Did y'all know that that's what that stood for? Huh? I want to show you a few more symbols. Let's see if you guys... Now, I know we're in church and everything, and y'all don't watch any of this stuff, and you've never even heard of it, but it's okay for the next few minutes to act like you do. What about this one? How do y'all know that? Y'all supposed to be Christians. <laughs> Batman. Okay. What about this one? Captain America. Captain America. Y'all are three for three. If this was a game show, y'all would be winning. <laughs> what about this one? Wow. My goodness. Okay. What about this one? This one might be a, a little harder. The Flash. All right. What about this? Now, y'all, not, now y'all may not recognize this one. Y'all probably recognize that one. <laughs> Reason why I want to show you these things is because I find a pattern when I look at what society glorifies sometimes, uh, what society looks at sometimes. And I notice in what people are attracted to And I begin to notice what it is that makes them excited about this. Power. Some of the most blockbuster movies, the ones that collect the most revenue, are movies with characters from comic books, uh, from stories from any kind of superhero. Do you know why? Because they like something about these individuals. They create Superman. What's Superman? Well, something is happening and this guy runs into a phone booth and he takes off his business suit and all of a sudden he is flying through the air with a cape and there's something bad going on and he stops it. There's, he's a hero. Now, Superman real? No. But people like it. They spend money to watch his movies. They spend money in order to get them on DVD so they can watch them again and again because there's something about him that they like. Somebody's robbing the bank. Look in the air. You know, they see him coming. Bullets bounce off this guy, this comic book character. And people like that. You've got Batman who lives in a city that is full of mess and crime. And he comes in and he stops the crime, right? You've got Captain America that was, he was created uh, around the time of World War II. We were looking for somebody that could be a hero, that could go against Hitler. We wanted to see somebody just dominate him. Amen? And people began to watch it because they thought, man, this is what we're really wanting. You've got the Flash. Man, he's fast. If I could move as fast as him, I could work several jobs a day. And I could get everything done that my wife wants me to have done before she gets home. (laughs) Ten seconds before she walks in the door. You've got Spider-Man who can shoot out web and stop criminals. He's he's fast. He can jump all over the place. And you've got Hulk who has nothing can stop him. He can move through walls. Nothing, you know, nothing can stop him. People love this stuff, don't they? What is it that people like about these characters they are faced with opposition and there are these heroes who 
what would normally be an opposition and be something that would stop people, for them, it doesn't stop them. And it gives them control over their environment. It gives them control over their circumstances. People flock to the movies to watch this stuff because their own life, their world around them, like Batman, has a world filled with crime, a world filled with malice. Like these made up worlds, they are faced with stuff that they, they themselves cannot stop. And so just for two hours or for 30 minutes or however long the movie or the show is that you're watching with this, they're able to forget about everything that is on top of them, everything that is keeping them from being able to succeed, everything that is trying to stop them. They're able to watch something on TV, even though it's not real. And they're able to see somebody who has control over their circumstances. Somebody, when opposition comes forward to them, they say, it's okay, I'm going to turn green and I'm going to bust through some walls or if you're going to try to rob this bank, it, bank, bullets, you know, bounce off of me. They hear about shootings all the time. But when they watch this, this guy is completely invincible and a bullet can't stop him. And it makes them happy. I love these, some of these characters. But do you know I found that after the movie's over, my circumstances have not changed. My show may have ended, but the life that I had before the show come on is the same life as it was afterwards. Amen? But I have good news for you. We have somebody who doesn't need any of those abilities because he's creator of all things. I've never seen a superhero. In fact, there has never been anything that has ever been created in these comic books that would even, even though it's made up, could even stand next to what God really is. It would be a short show because something would happen and God would just say, no, and it wouldn't happen. <laughs> Somebody could be getting ready to leave to go rob the bank. And if God, you know, the police don't have to be there. Nobody has to get hurt. Nobody even has to know that it's happening. And it, this happens sometimes. God just says no. And they don't make it. They don't make a good movie. But it does if you realize how great God is and what he has stopped. We see all the things that happen all the time. But we don't see how many things God stops from happening. And guess what? God wants to stop all of the bad things from happening. But do you know why bad things still happen sometimes? Because we are managing our surroundings. We are managing the earth. I hear people say all the time about the Twin Towers and uh, about different disasters. They say, oh, how can God be real? If I were God, this is what they say, if I were God, I would have stopped those planes from running into the Twin Towers. I would have made all of those guys on that plane, those terrorists, I would have made them have a heart attack. Let me ask you something. God's all-seeing, all-powerful, all-knowing. Could he have spoke a word and made them have a heart attack? Yes. Did he? No. So people that don't believe in God, that may be watching this right now, they might be saying, well, what kind of God is that that would allow that to happen? But see, the thing is, God is so holy to his word. When Adam was on the earth before the fall, God had a kingdom. He had a government that was in place. And guess what? Everything was fine. Man decided to go his own way and God said, okay, that's fine. I'm going to get back to the way that it's supposed to be. But I'm going to let you rule the way that you want to. I'm going to let you govern the way that you want to govern. And guess what? The world's a mess. So when we see things, we can't say, well, that's just the way it is. We can't say, well, God, you could have stopped this. It's your fault. We can't say that. Because guess whose fault it is? 
hours. Ricky said something really good this morning about um, about guns. He said, Becky, his wife said, you know, we wouldn't have to have we wouldn't have to have these guns if there was peace. I lost this little piece off of here and it's making all kinds of noise. Do y'all hear that? Amen. We wouldn't have to have guns if we had peace. Well, guess why we have to have guns? Because man's government is in place. It's not until the Lord's kingdom is established that we beat the swords into plowshares. That's in the Bible. When we don't need things to protect ourselves, it is a sign that the kingdom is in place. Amen? He lives inside of us now, but we don't have the literal manifestation of God's kingdom yet. We have his people. Amen? And we're supposed to show everybody in our actions and our words what it's like to be in the kingdom. We're supposed to have evidence. We're supposed to have control over our circumstances because we're in God's kingdom. And guess what? Just like these comic book characters, people are looking for somebody who has control over their circumstances. And when they see it, and it's not a movie, and it's not a show, but it's something that is real and that can actually impact their life, not just their emotions for a two-hour movie. They'll want it. Matthew nine thirty-five through 37 uh, this one's going to be from new international version jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues proclaiming the good news of the king, kingdom and healing every disease and sickness when he saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were what what were they they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd that is a perfect time for a man to run into a phone booth. Amen? <laughs> but God, who sent his son, guess what? He was looking for trouble. He was looking for things that did not line up with the way they were supposed to be. And when he seen this, he had compassion. And guess what he wanted to do? Change it. Doesn't that sound like a superhero? All of these things that we have, that we watch, that are just, it gets us excited because somebody has some type of power or ability to stop things or to make things happen the way they want to. If they would just realize that God, all of those things are associated from the original creator who says, you don't have to be sick. You don't have to be in poverty. You don't have to be stricken. You don't have to be smited. You don't have to have people have control over you. You don't have to let people get you down. You don't have to be depressed. I'm going to have to leave it off. It's just wanting to fall off. We don't have to have that. All we need is Jesus. He made a way. Are y'all getting this? He made a way for us. We don't have to. See, those superheroes, there was stuff going on, but they had to yell out and have somebody come. And guess what? If he's here, there's somebody dying on the other side of town. But Jesus fills all heaven and earth. Amen. He fills all space. And guess what a superhero does in these shows? After he does something, he leaves. We have God, the creator, who says, Lo, I will always be with you, even to the end of the earth. I've never seen a superhero say that. <laughs> and guess what? God's real. Amen? Is that not exciting? Man, if people would get this, they wouldn't have...
have to have all these other things that, that, that to help them emotionally. He is the hope. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He was saying, look, I see them harassed. They are helpless. I'm here to help. The harvest is plentiful. Do you know what that meant? It meant there are some people who are hurting. There are some wicked people who are out there. But what he was saying is I see people who are ready to be picked. And to be brought into the kingdom. We look around us sometimes and we say, man, things are bad. People are lost. Our attitude needs to change about it. Yes, that is the truth. But our perspective needs to be, man, there's a lot of work to do. If I go to my job and I can't find anything to do, I'll get nervous because... Why they need me. So when I look around right now and I see the harvest is plentiful. There are many people ready to be picked. They are lost. They need the Lord. They're waiting for somebody to come up and to pick them. To show them. But guess what? Need workers. What happens if the workers don't care. What happens if the workers say, well, I've got plenty of apples. Why do I need to go out and try to pick more? Why do I need to do that? I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to eat my apples and I'm going to be happy. Is that the right attitude? Look at this, John 18, 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself or did others tell it thee of me? What is he asking him? Are you a king? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? You know, I, I, I just find it interesting. See, people think all this stuff that they, they watch on TV and they see in these movies, they think, man, that's original. No, it's not. They get this stuff from God. <laughs> Some of the best stories that make up movies now come straight from the Bible. Look. My kingdom is not of this world. Where's Superman from? Another place. <laughs> All these things we see on TV, they're looking for somebody who's not in this world who can come here from another place and help them. That sounds like God. Have y'all ever put that together? Is this new to anybody? Yay. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... Then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. Woo! Man, that gets me excited. And I'm the only one. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. He showed up, said, repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Guess what? I'm the king. How many know God brought a kingdom? Jesus brought a kingdom. That is the only reason why he was able to come and to tell you, blind eyes be open, deaf ears be open. Because somebody who had power, somebody who had control over circumstances was able to show up and to change what they thought could not be changed. He saw them harassed and he said, it's okay, the king's here. Is it not exciting? Woo! Get excited!
excited about that. For this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Listen to this. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. What he's saying is, if you're one of mine, you listen and you hear me. If you're not one of mine, guess what? You're not going to listen. Well, actually, you may listen, but you're not going to hear. Amen? Matthew 7. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Look. There is something that we're missing. There is a level of relationship that God wants us to have with him. And once it clicks, man, I am trying to get it to click. Once it clicks, people won't be looking at their watches anymore, wondering how long it's going to be. Wondering what they're going to do when they get home. Wondering about tomorrow. They will be so just drawn to the truth and what is happening that they won't want to leave. I mean, can you imagine you leave a service, you walk out, and the entire congregation goes with you? That's what they did with Jesus. They followed him. Everywhere he went. Why? Because this guy had control over his circumstances. And guess what? They wanted control over theirs. Amen? They seen that he taught. That that attracted them. I hear the scribes. I listen to it. But guess what? While I'm listening, I'm ready to go home. But with this guy, there is something different about the way he teaches. Because he teaches as somebody who is not harassed by the elements, not taken over by life, but as somebody who has authority over it. We want to learn more about him. That's what they were saying. They were astonished. How often have you ever left a service and said, man, I'm I'm astonished. If Jesus is in it, you'll be astonished. This is going to be a short one tonight. (laughs) But I want you all to grasp all of this. We have to look and, and realize what people are looking at. We have to see what it is that is getting people's attention. Sometimes we look at stuff and we say, man, that, see, that's just ungodly. You know, their, their time is consumed by it. But what is it that's attracting them to it? They're attracted to it. It's not that their attraction to it makes them, man, I'm miserable, but I'm just doing this. No, there's something about it. I've heard people preach and teach and they're not reaching the young generation today because the young generation is, doesn't really care about the approach that this preacher may be approaching from. They don't care. Things that put us under conviction as kids and as teenagers. Today, they just wave it off. It doesn't bother them. And you'll say something. You'll say something to them and you think, man, this is going to get them. And because when you were a kid, man, you would have spent the rest of the night, Lord, please forgive me. And you, you, It would have scared you to death. But you tell them, they say, I don't care. And we keep trying the same approaches sometimes. 
and it's not getting through. If you were working on your car and you thought, man, it's got to be the battery and you bought a new battery and you changed it out and you put it on, you said, it's not working. And you, you took it out and you took it back and you got another battery and you put it in. How many times are you going to keep changing out that battery? Once you realize, hey, my battery was bad, I got another one, this one, maybe it's bad, I got another one, or maybe it was defective, I got another one, eventually you're going to say, hey, this ain't working. We have to be wise and try to find what it is that is attracting people to certain stuff. It don't mean we have to associate with these things, but there's something that has got their attention. Do you know what Jesus did? He would show up to a place and he wouldn't immediately tell them, look, before I can heal you, you need to go down here and you got to do this and you better do this. and you gotta. He wouldn't give them all this stuff. We do that sometimes. He would just say, what do you want? Did the Roman centurion find a church, start paying tithes, st- uh, start wearing robes, try to become a member of the clergy? Did, he, did, he, did you see him change his whole life and then come and say, all right, Now let me tell you about one of my servants. Did he do that? No, he was still a pagan. What did Jesus do? Healed his servant. Do you know what that did? That got to him more than anybody else could have gotten him because he's seen something that worked. Now he don't care what it's about. He might have he might have thrown all that stuff off before. Oh, I don't want to hear about God. I don't want to hear about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He, before he might have pushed all that stuff and said, I don't want nothing to do with it. But now he sees evidence of something that is working. And he says, I don't care what it is. I'll follow. I've heard many, many stories of different evangelists who have been overseas and they've been in Muslim countries and they're going to have a service. And I've heard several different stories about this happening. Somebody who is a Muslim coming with their kid or coming with a sick family member and they say, look, my son's sick. I've heard healing happens here. If you would just... Touch them and heal them. I'll serve this Jesus. See? Sometimes we keep trying to, oh, you, you, oh you're oh, you Muslim? Well, you got to quit doing this and this and this. No, they, they're not going to quit doing that. They are grounded in what they're doing. They need to see something that is effective with what you're doing. Because if they try some stuff, well, my God's not working. I heard Jesse one time, he said he was on a plane and he said this guy was beside him. And he said, he I forget what religion he was a part of. It's been years since I've heard this. He said, but he saw a, some little bolt out there or some little nut. And he said, they called it a Jesus nut. He said, because if this thing ever came loose, he said, you, you got some trouble. He said, and that thing was shaking on takeoff. And he said, all of a sudden, that thing got to rattling and the plane got to shaking. And he started praying. And he said, the guy at him started praying to his God he said the thing was going down going down towards the ground and he's praying to Jesus Lord Jesus and talking in tongues this guy's praying to his God he said that guy finally turned to him and said my God my God's not working I'm going to try yours see when you have something that you, you got a smile on your face and you're saying Jesus man you, you're going to convict some people they don't care what they have served they don't care what they have done all they know is I want to smile and be happy But see, sometimes we are so bent on, no, you're going to think, we're really not trying to convince them to come to God. We're just saying, I want you just to believe the way, what I say is right. And guess what? People don't want to do that. That's why we're supposed to pray, Lord, let everything around me be according to thy will. Let your kingdom come and impact everything around me. Because that's what people see. They see results in your life. People
People have a hard time getting that though sometimes. Sometimes they see people and they know that they give a lot of offering and they know they have a lot of money and they think, man, see, I'd give a lot of offering too if I had a lot of money. But see, that ain't the way it works. If they really would get it in their mind that the reason they have a lot of money is because they give a lot of offering. If they could associate it that way, they would say, man, bro, I got to give more. Let me give you a couple of kingdom concepts of a king that are awesome. I don't want to put, I don't know if it's right or appropriate to categorize God as, as a hero because we associate things with hero and I don't like to classify God in any category that we classify man as. Amen? He says, I'm God, and beside me, there's no other. And that just, that's, he's in a class all by himself. A king is not elected by vote. John 18, 37 says, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. I love this. There wasn't an election in heaven. He's always been king. He's called the ancient of days. Next one. If y'all write these down, you'll remember them a lot longer. It is a king's birthright to be a king. He is king not because of somebody's decision, Remember those superheroes? Guess what? Every one of them has some kind of weakness. You've watched Superman, haven't you? She said, kryptonite, see? God has no weaknesses. If it were possible for God to have a weakness, the only thing that I could say that it would be would be worship. Because I see all through the Bible where God's going to do something and they begin to worship and he says, I'm going to add 15 years to his life. <laughs> Colossians 1, 12 through 15. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Look at that. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? He has no beginning. He has no end. Why aren't y'all excited about that? Praise God. Thank you. I'm going to go over here and preach. Next one, a king cannot be impeached. He wasn't voted in. You can't vote him out. Amen? Guess what? Comic book characters die. Jesus died one time and it was on purpose because he was going to be raised from the dead. Amen? And he's alive forevermore. Revelation eleven fifteen. And the seventh angel sounded. I love this. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. That is exciting. It don't matter, that means it don't matter what is going on around this world right now. We can look and know that the kingdoms are going to be his. I just want to go ahead and be his right now, amen, and do what he wants me to do. The authority of a king is absolute. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I don't need to worship anything else. 
He's got it all. Amen? And do you know what I love? That unlike these superhero characters that people watch after and love and and collect everything, you have to have them come to help. God made it where there are things in it, that are put into place by his word. He says, look, I don't even have to move. I'm just going to make a law. And if you line up with my word, guess what? It happens. Amen. Is that not awesome? I love that. Man, the authority of a king is absolute. Uh, Revelation 17, 15 through 17. And he saith unto me, the waters... Which thou sawest, I love this, where the whole earth, whole, the, where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill what? his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Man, if that don't show you that God is in control of all things. He's saying, look, they're going to, because I have made it to be this way, I'm telling you this is going to happen. God's saying, I, at any point I could just say, give me the kingdoms. But he's, he is so in control that he can allow things to transition or to change hands into things that we consider wicked. And he says, I'm not sweating it a bit. They're still going to be mine. Man. Woo! I'm going to get excited all by myself about that. That is wonderful. Do you realize how in control God is? He doesn't sweat. He doesn't get nervous. He doesn't, he he never says, "Uh uh-oh, That is awesome. He is saying this is going to happen. Look, if you knew something bad was going to happen or what you associate as being bad, you would put all your power into stopping it. This has been in place for a long time. It hasn't occurred quite yet completely the way the full manifestation of this scripture. It's going to. He knows it's going to happen. And he says it's going to happen because I'm speaking it. I'm telling you this is going to happen. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. At any point, I could take him back. But he's allowing it to happen. Is that not control over circumstances? How many wants to serve this God? The word of a king is law. Are these not awesome? Have you ever read of anybody or anything that has power and control like this? Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. That is awesome. I've never read a comic book that gave me (laughs) such hope. God says, if it's in my mind and I speak it, it's going to happen. That's a shut case, amen? You just got to sit back, get you some iced tea, and just watch God work. You know what we do sometimes? We think we're helping, we're helping God. We know what his word says, but then we're just waiting for things to change. God wants us to be able to sit back and say, it's going to be fine. Things just go, can fall apart all around us, and we say, It's fine. Next concept. Everything in a kingdom is the personal property of the king. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world. And guess what? They that dwell therein. He owns the people. Do y'all take care of your property? How much better is God? The word of a king is unchanging. Isaiah 48, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
This is wonderful. I don't need any other hero. All I need is Jesus. All I need is God. And it is so easy to get every bit of this to line up with my life. All I have to do is line up with his word. Gosh, even in Batman, they got to get to this roof, hope the power hadn't been cut out so they can broadcast this beam of light into the sky. And you better hope it's overcast so that it has some clouds to hit on. Amen? And hope he's not asleep. <laughs> hope he's looking. You have some trouble come. Oh, you got, you don't have to, you can be in the darkest dungeon. You just have to say, Lord, a king chooses his citizens. This is awesome. John 15, 16, and 19. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Man, read, read that. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Who chose you? He. Who's he? The Lord. That is awesome. The king. A king chooses his citizens. How does a king choose his citizens? He puts things in place and determines the standards of citizenship. He says, look, it, you're either for me or against me. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. See, those are determinations of citizenship. Look, if you're mine and you're my sheep, you listen to my voice and you do what I say. See, that is a determination of a standard of citizenship. That's how he chooses. You can say that you're his if you want to, but unless you're doing what he says, he's not really your Lord. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Man, if you had to get a vote and you had to get people to vote you into the kingdom, my goodness, we might all be lost. There are some people that probably... They're not going to say it, but when they put their vote in, they're saying no. <laughs> Can anybody think of a few in your life that would have said no? <laughs> I am so thankful that he chose me. What if you had to go to a church and you had to be accepted and voted in so that you could go to heaven? And ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. He chooses you. We should be so happy about that. The reason we're alive, everybody take a deep breath. Sometimes I just take a deep breath, close my eyes and take a deep breath to remind myself that I am only alive because God created me. I am not alive because of some fluke of nature of some protons bouncing around and this big bang happening and just there happened to be a solar system that was perfect in the amount of carbon, perfect distance from the sun, everything aligned, just perfect. I'm not here because of that. I'm here because God designed it that way. He made it that way. I am breathing right now because he had a conscious decision to create me. And the only reason why I'm still breathing his oxygen right now is because he has a conscious decision to use me. Man, that is exciting to me. Sometimes we feel like, well, God's just got a few and I'm just kind of random out here. No, you're alive because God chose you. Man, that gives me purpose in the morning. God actually, look, he didn't just like roll some dice and, and deal out some cards. 
Every single one of you. He looked and said, I am making this one. Their name is going to be this. This is the gifts I'm giving them. This is how tall they're going to be. This is how much hair we're going to lose. Lord, I'm still believing that there's something changing in the future. Uh, He knew everything about you. Man, that is such a loving God. Last scriptures. Oh, I had wrote down a point I was wanting to say and I skipped it. The word of a king is law, right? One thing good about law is law gives continuity. If it wasn't for law, then every time there was a new administration that came into place. They would recreate the entire constitution every time. And you would, businesses would have to shut down. Everything would have to stop so that they can find out how we are going to function now. We have the constitution. Now, many administrations come in and they decide to interpret the constitution in different ways. But there's only so much change that can actually occur. Because you have people saying, no, that's not the way it is. See, even between changes of administration, you have continuity because of law. Life keeps going even though the administration changes. That's why before the election, you had certain things going on in your life. You had a certain income. You had certain taxes you pay. After the election, guess what? You still have those things in place. There may be some variables that change, like the amount of taxes or what you have to do here or there, but you're not starting over after every administration change. Law is a good thing. They get in fights and fusses and arguments all the time because they want to know what it was the founders, what was their original intent when they made this law? When they created this, what were they intending? And they battle it out and debate over this stuff. What did they really mean by this? It would be wonderful if they could just raise them from the dead and say, look, what did you mean? And they could tell them. But they can't. So they have to look at the letter of the law and try to figure out what the spirit of the law is supposed to be. Do you know what's awesome? The word of a king is the law. And guess what? The king is still alive. What's funny is people still try to change God's law. But the one who made it is still alive. And if they would seek him and not seek the rest of the members of the cloth or the church to decide what they believe that interpretation is, but if they would get on their face and fast and seek the Lord, man, we would have so many less problems. Before they went and voted to see whether they should allow a a bishop who is a homosexual to take office as a bishop, if they had not said, well, we got about 70, let's go vote and talk about this. If they had said, we're going to fast And we're going to get in God's word. We're going to look at every single scripture. And we're going to see God's face of whether this is right. Man, all they would have heard is no. But they listen to society. And what society says. And they don't care about the king. But guess what? No matter what they change, it doesn't make the king's word invalid. The word of a king is forever. Hebrews chapter 12, 20 through 29. I want y'all just to listen to this. This is so good. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator, of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. 
For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Jesus said one time, every stone that is upon another, everything's going to be shaken. Even these industries who create these comic book characters that people get excited about, I'm not speaking against these comic book characters. What I'm saying is sometimes people get so associated with this stuff and they won't change. And if they just realize that, hey, after this movie's over, my life's going to be the same. Maybe there is a real God that really has control over circumstances that is not shaken. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and what? Godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Many times they saw miracles. They saw things happen. And you know what it did when they saw people? You remember they were laughing about him saying, you know, this person is going to be raised from the dead. He went into that child's room and he kicked all of them out and they were laughing at him. They said, this child is dead. But when the child came walking out, the Bible says fear fell on all of them. See, fear can happen with good things happening. When people see the power of God working in your life, they're gonna realize that there is no other explanation And you know what? It makes them afraid. Do you know why? Because they were going against him. And they were on the losing side. Y'all stand with me. Ronnie, will you get that song ready? We want to thank you guys for watching us on the internet. Our prayer is that you come to know the Lord Jesus. Our prayer is that God would become the most important thing in your life. And we promise you, because it's worked for us, that if you come to him, your entire life will be changed. We ask you just to pray this prayer right now if you want to be saved. Father, who is in heaven, I know that your son came to this earth and died on a cross and shed his blood for the remission of my sins. I confess that I am a sinner and I confess that the Lord Jesus is my Lord and Savior and my owner from this day forth. Come into my heart and save me. If you prayed that prayer, we want you to go to lmcigreenville.org. We want you to click contact at the top and we want you to send us a message. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. Everybody... Bow your heads and close your eyes.